Good afternoon here in Hawaii. Good evening or good morning if you're watching from somewhere else. Thanks so much for joining us, Think Tech Hawaii. And we're back. And we're about to enter come Monday, February 1st, the year of the tiger. And we have with us Tina Patterson from Germantown, Maryland, noted raconteur, arbitrator, mediator, the Jacqueline of many trades, Rebecca Ratliff, survived many years at very high levels in the insurance claims industry, pretty much intact and stronger than ever. And that's testimony to the kind of strength that we all admire and emulate. And Ben Davis, what can we say? Now at Washington and Lee, formerly University of Toledo School of Law, in demand pretty much everywhere. If you were an NFL football team and you were looking for a new head coach, Ben would be at the top of pretty much anyone's list. Okay, so the year of the tiger, known for strength, exercising evils, and courage, bravery. Do we have any tigers with us? Are any of you born in the year of the tiger? Uh, I was 55. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think I was. Uh, I think there was a movie, wasn't there a movie called The Year of Living Dangerously, which was about a year of the tiger and also didn't, it wasn't the year that Mao died was the year of a tiger. The um, year of the tiger would be 1950. Yeah, okay, okay. And 1962, 1974, 86. All those years have gotten past me either above or below. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, my, uh, my wife is a tiger year person, so. Yeah. Aren't they supposed to be very unsettling years? The year, tiger year, a lot happens or? Yeah, they can be years of change. It, the change can be depending on how the energies align. This is the year of the black water tiger. And so it could be fresh start kind of year, or it could be, as you say, uh, uh, threatening kinds of change. So mm. we'll have to see. Uh, what do you think's on the horizon for the year of the tiger? Uh, um, well, uh, I, I'll jump in by just saying that uh, the uh, Europeans and the American reaction to what the Russians are doing on the border with Ukraine. Um, I'm hopeful that we won't have a war, uh, that somehow the cool heads, I don't know if they're cool, the hot heads or whatever heads, they, you know, at the end of the day, people are not going to start shooting at each other because I think everyone understands whether anywhere in Europe and Russia, that you know we don't want to have a, a shooting war. There's already a kind of a war going on for eight years there, but escalating to another level. So maybe uh, that's what I think will be a little bit of light, if I could say it like that. That this we, we will wind our way out or down or away from this kind of thing. Um, maybe I'm speaking too hopefully, but I just think that no one in Europe would ever want to go back to war. You know. None of it. Yeah, and one of the commentators made an interesting remark. He said the greatest risk of war uh, with Russia and the Ukraine is Putin, because uh, she said Putin is like Trump. If he really feels it's going to play to his base, he may do it, even though it makes no political sense at all. Yeah. Yeah, and and that you know, um, the, the the only the only thing I would just say is that he is KGB, you know, and so you know, and he's he you know he's got his 
uh, I think he's smart enough to see where where the power angles work or don't work for him. He's a he's a he's a user of power. Uh, fair enough. But so are all these other players too. Trust me, they are ruthless at the heads of these con- countries. I would include Biden in that. You know, I mean, it's when you're running this thing, and you've got your national security folks and all that around it. There are options being played out. And I just think that when everybody looks at what the what happens if you go to a hot war, they're like, no, we, you know, we, it's, it's, you know, there's what, 13,000 American troops that are going to be in the, you know, the whole Estonia thing, uh, that whole, are, are we really going to do this this way? You know, I just don't think that anyone has a stomach for that kind of, at least I hope doesn't have a stomach for that kind of uh, uh, atrocious thing. So that's where in place I'd start. The second thing is the the Breyer resignation, right? Or that is swirling this whole midterm, right? With, uh, I think, uh, and I was trying to remember whether uh, Biden uh, promise to put a black woman on the Supreme Court, whether uh, Johnson back in uh, the mid 60s promised when he put, Thur- you know, Thurgood Marshall was his nominee, whether he had made a promise beforehand. I did hear that Reagan, when he ran, had said he promised to put a woman on the Supreme Court as part of, uh, uh, you know, his pitch. So the, you know, this is a kind of an interesting moment to watch how this all plays out with regards to both the cases that are before the Supreme Court and how the Breyer uh, uh, succession gets done. Um, I think it's an interesting set of energies. I don't know if they're good or bad or dark or light and or whatever, but I think it's pretty exciting. And I heard some names of some incredible uh, um, uh, black judges black women judges who are uh, being considered. So I don't know. Those are a couple of things that I, that struck me. Uh, hey, so what does it tell us, the nature and timing of Breyer's resignation? I mean, here's a guy who's been a very pragmatic, consensus-oriented, very influential in swinging Kennedy's vote with the other four a number of times. Um, an important negotiator. Yeah, yeah. Of the three liberal justices. Oh, what does the timing of his resignation tell us about what he's seeing or what he might think is important? What does it tell you? I can jump in again if, if uh, but I, I want to defer to Tina or Rebecca if you have something um, that you wanted to say on this. But um, one comment that I'd make is uh, I think that uh, the cat got out of the bag a little early for him, from what I'm reading. In other words, he had made a decision two weeks ago that this is what he was going to do, but when he was going to make the announcement, kind of got caught up in somebody getting a scoop here and there. So, you know, his timing may have been forced on him, so to speak, that that it ends up now as opposed to maybe when he wanted to. But be that as it may, um, the the thing that is, is that uh, the nomination process of someone to be his replacement is going to eat up this year, right? And I think it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and what the whole dance of the politics sort of puts out in the open as to who people really are one more time, right? You know, it's the Maya Angelou line of like, if somebody shows you who they are one time, you can believe them. But now with an explicit choice of a a president saying, I'm going to put a black woman on the Supreme Court you can watch how you know the 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 forces of uh, resistance and the forces of embracing such an an idea will how they will play themselves out 
in 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 this uh, American uh, kind of series of euphemisms that we watch uh, in the way that people talk about things. You know, I I mean, who's going to be resistant? Who's going and how are they going to express their resistance to the person? Is you know, is it going to be the classic sort of uh, not enough experience, right? You know, or or uh, you know, how did you decide this way? I mean, you've seen some of this with these uh, lower court judges that happen who came out of public defender or other types of areas. You know, like you know, are you a radical leftist, so to speak, because you are you know defense counsel? You know, what I mean, it's like, come on, you know, it's just you. I, I'll be curious to watch both. Uh, how the person is, is is supported and how the person is uh, defended. I, I salute the person who puts their hat in the ring to do this. And that woman is going to be a very strong woman. But I will be really happy that she's on the Supreme Court for a couple different reasons. But what personally, one of the reasons I'd really be happy is that the only justice on the Supreme Court who quote unquote, is a black person will not still be Clarence Thomas. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, you mean Jimmy's and, husband. Huh? Yeah, right. Right. I mean, for me um, to have another voice from the black community uh, who's a jurist, who's excellent and all that stuff, um, because, I, you know, I've I, I read on cases, and unfortunately, the affirmative action cases coming up now and all this stuff. And, you know, it, I've gotten tired of kind of the the Thomas shtick on certain things. I mean, you just had this decision that they had to do about the National the National Archives releasing documents for the with regards to Trump, right? And you'd had the district court and the uh, appeals court that basically said, release them. And it goes to the Supreme Court, and it's an eight-one decision. Now, one of the things that maybe people don't realize is back when it was the tapes of Nixon, it was a nine-zero decision to release the tapes, and that was one of the reasons that precipitated his resignation. That there was no leg to stand on at the Supreme Court, and so you know, to, to be the one leg, so to speak, to for the somebody to think that is the way to that. There was some merit to the Trump arguments, you know, uh, you know, that, that bothered me. And there was even a sort of a concurrence from Kavanaugh I read. And I was like, ah, uh, you know, these guys are, well, you know, I thought that the the eloquence of this position, which was basically under the standard that would have applied when the if he was in office, this stuff is not covered. Boom. So release it. We're not going to get into the. Uh, uh, post-presidency part of it, we're just going to say, on the stand that would have applied if he'd been in president, it's, he couldn't keep this stuff out, you know? And it's like, that's a great, you know, I mean, it's a good result. It's 8-1, it could have been 6-3 or something else, but still it bothered me that Thomas, you know, marked out that place that I I think is, it's kind of a, like a little sort of, uh, uh, royalist, if I can say it in the American tradition, the sort of the les majeste or the king is with, you know, even the, the king is without fault or something like that, or some sovereign pixie dust is remains after you've left office in the presidency. You know, no, you know, that's not, that's why we fought this, the Revolutionary War, to stop that kind of uh, way of looking at things. And there is a debate. I mean, there's been back to the beginning about this sort of the sovereign immunity status of the of the president, right? But, you know, I always thought it came down on the other side, which is the president is an administrator that we put in place, right? And when they leave, there's a new boss and the new boss decides what the administration does, you know, for good or for evil, unfortunately, but there you go. Well, in fairness, we got to remember that he, he's got to go home to somebody who's a big fan of the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys. <laughs> Yes. You got to live with what you got to live. But the timing is important. Tina, your thoughts. Uh, ben, you have, I have a list of things that I was thinking about for this year of the tiger and what I, I, 
I want to talk about the, the, the Supreme Court justice candidates. And I agree with you wholeheartedly, Ben. I think the timing um, was a surprise to Breyer when it was actually announced. Because when I heard it yesterday, I was like, okay, you know, knowing this man's history, this would have been something thought out and cal well calculated, given that we've got this backdrop of midterm elections. And you know, I don't want to sound like I've got the cloud of doom hovering over me, but I think we're going to see some midterm election outcomes that we don't want to see. Um, people have been waiting since 2020, and they're seeing the midterm election as that opportunity, which means this justice candidate has to be vetted and in place. The most recent appointment, that was a fluke. I'll, I'll say that that was a fluke and we probably won't see that again where someone is literally vetted and pushed through within a week. Um, I was gonna say two this, days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it was, it was three days. You're right. I, I don't think we're gonna see that. One, uh, you know, what I heard on the news, you know, Biden is, Biden plans to appoint a black woman. And the first person I thought of is the recently deceased Professor Lani Guineer and the grief that she went through when she was, she hadn't even started the process and people were peeling back things from 20, 30 years ago. You said this, you must mean this. And I thought, whoever these candidates are, as you said, Ben, they have got, they are going to have to have armor on because mm. you, we already have senators saying, whoever the candidate is, we're going to we're going to give them a hard time. And, and, and so where does the process become fair? Where does the process really allow for us to see the best of, of what that candidate can do or what they may potentially do as a justice? I'm, I'm also concerned about, as far as timing, the midterm elections. And I'm gonna go back a step as well, because I think this is also tied in as well. This discussion, and I'll admit, I'm a little bit of a foreign policy wonk. So um, this discussion regarding Ukraine, Russia, and the United States was before my time. Um, and I'm, I'm talking about the concept of brinksmanship. We, Biden, whether you like him or don't like him, he is trying to exercise his version of brinksmanship and it could either go smoothly or it could blow up. And a lot of it is going to be contingent upon the NATO countries that are in the vicinity of Ukraine. But it also means the 1950s version of brinksmanship doesn't apply today. And jurisdictions are already being warned. If this moves forward and the escalation begins, be prepared for a cyber attack, whether that's social media or that is your your systems, whether that's a bank, whether that is your, your utilities, that be prepared for a cyber attack. We've seen it before, we've seen it again. People are always talking about, well, it's generally China. There's a number of actors. Um, I, I see that played in as well. And how even with this process of selecting the next Supreme Court justice could be subject to misinformation and sending out stories, disinformation to really get the public riled up about something that may not even happen. So um, you know, Chuck, you were talking about the energy and what it could and could not be the other part of the year of the tiger that I remember is the opinionated and stubborn aspects that are sometimes associated with this year. And we could literally see this. One thing that um, I listened to the um, representative uh, from the United States to Russia as he delivered the president's message yesterday. And he the story continued with President Biden has indicated that he is prepared to um, request personal sanctions against Putin. Um, you know, again, brinksmanship, but are you really prepared? And are you prepared for what that aftermath may be? Because Ben, I, I think you're absolutely right. He will use by any means necessary. And I don't mean it in the sense of Malcolm X as yeah. he stated it, but I mean, he will use any resource. We saw it in the 2016 election. We saw it to some extent in the 2020 election, but I think they're all woven in. The last thing I'll say, and Rebecca, I'll hand it to you after this. Um, I'm hearing this and I know I brought it up last week. All, all of the moving dynamics in our society 
US society, but also globally, would point to if we looked at the US from an outside lens, we are on the brink of civil war. Um, and that civil war would be related to the outcome of the 2020 election. People are still upset about that. COVID, what that means, it's dividing families, it's dividing businesses, it's dividing jurisdictional um, regulations. You have governors telling school jurisdictions, you don't have to follow your, your mask mandate. Kids show up in a juris local jurisdiction saying, no, show up with a mask. And then you've got to still have this ongoing discussion of regarding race. Um, and and it's, it's that just slow disintegration. Um, you know, I, and I, again, back to the foreign policy piece, if we were looking at another country, we'd say, you know, they're, they're on the brink. They're on the brink of becoming a failed nation or they're on the brink of having, I'll say it, a coup d'etat or an insurrection. But oops, we had that in January, 2021, didn't we? And I'll stop there, Rebecca, it's yours. January 6th, uh, exactly. Um, yeah. So, I have to say, first of all, that I'm really enjoying listening to the analysis coming from you, Ben, and from you, Tina. I think this is all brilliant. And I think you've said it all very eloquently, more eloquently than I could have. Um, and I have many of the same concerns. The, the state that America is in, and I think I've stated before, I'm, I'm a very patriotic person. We have family, um, a lot of family members who are in the military uh, on my husband's side. Um, and I always, uh, for me, hope in America springs eternal, um, despite our historic realities. Um, but I, I hear you. I have concerns about um, the continued civil unrest escalating. Um, I have concerns about um, how everything is getting politicized. And I'll tell you, I have a son in college, and I was talking to him today, and he was telling me about just the emotional unrest um, on his campus, just how college students are traumatized by the COVID pandemic and the effect on their ability um, to take advantage of their, you know, academic opportunities and other. Um, it's affecting sports, it's affecting lifestyles in a way um, that politicizing everything just exacerbates. And, and so I have concerns about um, the America that I have, you know, hope for. Um, because we we seem to be headed on a trajectory where there's just there's so much unrest. Um, I don't know how that gets fixed. And I mentioned that maybe in, in the show a couple of weeks ago, uh, even though I'm an optimist, I, I just don't know, um, you know, what's going to happen to uh, the, the, the American, you know, uh, America, the beautiful, because, um, every, you know, all of these different platforms and agendas um, and again, I don't have to repeat anything you said, Tina, or you, Ben. I think that you're spot on. Um, there are just so many um, factors now that aren't even, the point has become pointless. Mm. Um, yeah. And, and so it, it's, um, you know, we're really struggling as a nation. And what we do here affects what goes on um, all over the world. And so I, I do, I have so many of the same, I have the same concerns. Yeah, so we've got a power group with incredible media influence and public control of the narrative that seems to believe that the divisive, disruptive, obstructive things that you're talking about that are painful for the everyday lives of all of us, that that stuff works for them because they can blame it on the other side. Hey, it's the old, he touched it last mm. thing. Right. How might some kind of understanding energy resistance to that minority authoritarian divisiveness grow from the grassroots level? At the popular yeah. Because it's not going to come from leadership. No. Nope. So the I think a, a big part of the way the the particular populist movements we see now is doing what I think the psychologists call projection, right? You know, a, a casting onto the other person what in fact you were doing, right? You know. And unfortunately that mind game is a very 
difficult game to think in terms of that whenever somebody says something, you know. And so what would be great was to have leaders who could deconstruct that in a way that people realize the, you know, the, the, the absurdity of certain things. Like, I did think that uh, Biden made a speech at one point about the election where he said, now think about it, folks, every senator and, re and House of Representatives election was fine, but somehow the president on the same ballot was supposed to have been fake, you know. I mean, and, he, and I thought that's a nice little phrase to to bring it up, whether you believe it or not. You know, in terms of believing all the stuff about the big lie, I thought that was a really clear way of making people say, "Hey, this doesn't make sense." You know, Where's a the little logic? bit. Right. Where's the logic? Yeah. You know, I mean, if if you went and vote, and you you remember yourself voting and putting it up, and you voted for X, Y, Z, and A, B, D, and and then magically. The part that's the president was weird and everything else was okay. You know, it's like, I thought that was really good to me. You know, it's like, I mean, if you can buy this stuff, you know, and there's reasons to buy the stuff that are to your advantage. Like, you know, you can get, you know, uh, what your, your, you can shape the electorate for your advantage. I mean, there's all the cynical political game part of it, but in terms of sort of breaking through that, effort of projection. It's just like, um, I think uh, when Biden did that little sort of hesitancy about, or he said that the incursion, the, the Russians might do a little incursion into uh, Ukraine and all these people freaked out. Um, I heard that Trump said, oh, Biden has given Putin the green light. I said, no, it's Trump giving Putin the green light by that projection, you know, sort of like you see all these people mouthing the, the kind of Russian vision of things on places like Fox News and all that, you know, it's like people don't you see, you know, or being able to break through that and, 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 and express it in clear ways. I don't know who can do it, but I saw a little spark of it with that Biden comment at that point. Another guy is Clyburn. Clyburn's good at that stuff at breaking oh, yeah. through on things. So. Maybe it's, we need to have more Clyburn, you know, I don't know. So one thing that we don't seem to have, and MLK Day just less than two weeks ago have reminded us of that, is the kind of charismatic leader that speaks to and for the people that might help galvanize that common sense recognition that, hey, wait a minute. Hey, you're saying that you guys won a bunch of seats in the house hey, and gains over here and over there and at the states, but the election of the president was stolen while you were doing all that? Galvanizing common sense and getting people to think logically for themselves is a challenge. So in our last minute, hey, any magic sauces for how we get there? Tina? There's a group that I follow and I, I like their former heads of state and uh, other leaders. They're called the elders. Um, and what they what they purport is what you're talking about. It's, it's people working together um, at the gr grassroots level, but also from, from bottom up and saying, this won't work. And it's people like Madiba, former Madiba, um, Jimmy, um, Jimmy Carter, I was about to say Jimmy Stewart, Jimmy Carter and, and other um, heads of state and leaders that, that are saying, you know, this isn't working. We, we've got to take a different approach. So I, I would look to them. I was gonna say former President Obama, but that brings up, that, that riles another group altogether. So I'm gonna point to the elders. Good one. Ben, any quick thoughts in our last minute? Um, one person that I, I think has been consistent for a long time is Reverend Barber um, as a force. I mean, I know that he had successfully in North Carolina, his movement 
had done things in North Carolina, bringing together all kinds of people in a kind of almost neo civil rights movement kind of thing. And yeah, I just think that he speaks clearly. And uh, but it's getting the bandwidth and the craziness of our social media uh, that that he gets heard. But as a voice of uh, from the people, you know, who uh, I've always found him very powerful and persuasive. And Rebecca, to finish up, who should we be listening to? Our next generation. Um, the, the, the young people who are coming up, who have to live in this world that we're, that, you know, that we've crafted. Um, the next generation, they don't stumble over, they don't bow to tyranny and they don't stumble over what color somebody is wearing or what shade their skin is. And I think that really, if we listen to our young people that we will, I think we'll get where we need to be. And thank you all for that. Hey, with the image of Greta Thunberg in our minds. Hey. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Stand up, speak up, speak out. Here, here. <laughs>